interesting story, and welcome everyone. Can everyone hear back there in the back? Okay, if I start to fade, just put your hand up or something. Uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that um, my, I'd like to introduce the rest of me, which is that I'm a dad of six children, all successfully through college, and the last one getting married, and 13 grandchildren. So somehow, even though I had Asperger's, I knew how to do the rest of it, a little, at least functionally enough to get by. <laughs> and so I think I might be the only one that has to be on the, on the I'm uh, looking at someone else's suspect, or he says, okay, yeah. Okay, there's two of us in, on the panel. Um, so I'm gonna sort of like set you up for the rest of them, is what I'm gonna do. And uh, I wanna talk to you, I, you got my notes. Did everyone get my notes? Okay, I don't know if you can figure them out, but maybe you can figure them out as we go along. So, uh, this first one stands for shift. It's a car, it's a shifter for your car. And what we're talking about is shift happens. Okay, so when you're, when you're, uh, uh, it's a story from a student at our Berkeley Center who, during his, his parent meeting, started to say, um, oh, had all these problems, and he was saying, well, you know, S happens, and I said, no, shift happens, Sam, and and so we had this whole discussion about it, and and then I got him a T-shirt that said shift happens on it. And, and then all the students wanted them, so we started making them. So that's a little story for them to start you out with. The second one on, on your list there, and I have to 15 minutes, so I'm gonna cut right through tonight. What does that stand for? It stands for the parents and professionals role and it is to introduce uh, the right services and quality mentors to their students. So that is, a, you need to be a clearinghouse and a headhunter for your student, okay? So that's what that's all about. And to allow the student to make positive change, you're gonna to have to set them up. I mean, I'm sure that Susan's gonna talk about how she set up her daughter. She had to go and make sure she got the right school and the right services outside the school. You know, so you, there's a lot of things that parents have to do, not run their lives, but be a clearinghouse and a headhunter. That's your job. And so what's the third one? That's the law of regression or diminishing returns. And what that means is that during junior high school and high school, parents' activity in helping their students helps them. But after high school, it hurts them. The diminishing returns. Like you think, oh, I'm doing this. And you keep doing it, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's actually contributing to the problem. So the same thing you did that worked positively in junior high and high school actually hurts your student after high school. And that's a hard one to accept, but it's true. And I'm sure other people will speak to it. So let's go on to the next one. What's the next one with the chainsaw with the umbilical cord? That's the steel umbilical cord that's connected from your child to you, usually the mom, the, the Aspie mom or LD dad or whatever. And so it's hard to cut that. It, it requires a, a, a diamond blade and has to be cut by both sides. The student is usually more eager and easier to cut it than the parent. Surprisingly so. You know, the helicopter parents they talk about? Well, that's a problem because you've created this relationship that's sort of um, symbiotic with your son or daughter, that one has a learning disability, and it becomes a problem after they get out, when they get to a certain age. It actually can hamper them. So the student will not form relationships with peers at college, or he or she will not, their social development will suffer if you're their primary date or social connection. And even though you're addicted to this child, you gotta let go, because they have to learn to stand on their own feet. So the next one, what's the, the next one? It's two students carrying large bags of whatever. So this comes from a parent. I did a parent evaluation with a parent from the Berkshire Center in Massachusetts, and a parent said to me, you know, Dr. McMahon, and I said, what can we do better? And she said, this is after a kid graduated. She said, you need to let them struggle more while they're with you. So you can't make it too easy for them while they're with you because they need to learn what it's really like when they get out. You know, producing their own money and being able to stand on their own two feet. So that's what that one represents. And um, 
Uh, what's the next one, the DM? That is the problem with people on the spectrum. We resort, we, we go back to the default mode. Our default mode is what? Isolation. So I don't care what you did for your kid or what the parents did or the professionals. The default mode on the spectrum is isolation. So unless they internalize themselves that they're going to have to change their whole life and try new things, they're going to go right back. It's like, remember the Flintstones when they let, they let the, the dog out the front door and he goes in the window? That's what you're going to experience. That's what they'll do to themselves is, you know, they'll hide out. So they have to break that up. And what's the next one? The next one is that you need to support yourself first. It's like, you know, when you go on the airplane, it says, if the need for oxygen is, you know, put it on your favorite child first. You know, then, I mean, after you put it on yourself, then you put it on your favorite child. Because you have to put it on your fir yourself first. So if, it, if you have a crazy mom, you have a crazy child. If you have a calm mom, you have a calm child, generally. And so you need to do for yourself what you want your child to do first, which means get a life. And that means get a life outside of them, and they will start to pick up the ball and run for themselves. It's hard medicine. Parents don't like to hear it, especially moms get mad at me when I say this to them sometimes. What do you mean? If I don't do that, he will look at where you'd be right now. I said, well, you have to do it. If you don't start doing it now, when are you going to do it? You know, when they're 35? And it's too late. So the next one is not the World Trade Towers, but that's what it is, is a bar graph. And you see that there, they're equal. That bar graph represents the more that you let go, the better that they do. The more that you empower them and stay out of it, the better, the more they're going to learn. After you reach that age, you still have to have other people around them that can help them. But did you ever notice, those of you who have older children, like I do, some guy or some woman will tell your kid to do something that you've told them their whole life and they wouldn't do it for you and they'll do it for that guy. And you look at that weird person and you say, why would she do it for him or why did he do it for that guy? But you say, well, I'm glad she's doing it, but I don't know why she did it for him when he told her. But that's what happens. So. Okay, what's the next one? It's a can of soda, right? We tell our students, take a soda. This is what you're gonna use when a student calls and asks for a solution or to be rescued. You're gonna say, take a, drink a soda. In other words, stop. They need to observe what's going on. That's the O. Deliberate, and they can use the donkey rule, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and they can deliberate, and then they take action. So they have to use that process so if you want to ask the student to problem solve instead of giving them the answer or rescuing, let them do it for themselves in a safe environment, like, you know, with their counselors or any of these people or us, or, or you know, and you got to encourage them to do it their own thinking and their own actions and so self-advocacy. So the donkey rule, what is the donkey rule? Does anyone want to guess? And CIP staff have to know it or they're, they're, they're fired. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if five people call it a donkey and you're still call, calling it a horse, then don't be a jackass and do what they say. It's a common sense rule. It's why I have six CIPs and not one of them, because I use the donkey rule. Because I'm such a stubborn, opinionated, judgmental person that nothing, no other advice could get in there. So now when I use your microcomputers to make a decision and say, hey, Jim, what do you think I should do on this? Karen, what do you think I should do? Lori, what do you think I should do? And, you know, and then I take those and I say, okay, well, I guess I'll follow what they say, even though I was going to do this other thing. Then I get somewhere. Or I, once in a while I override the donkey rule, but at my own, you know, peril. <laughs> because I'm usually wrong, and uh, with social things anyway, usually. So I have to count on them steering me. Someone's got to give me a, like a one minute flag at least because I can go over easily. You're good. I'm okay, he put zero up, I thought I'm yeah. okay. Uh, so what's the next one? WWGT, when will we get there? And that's what parents ask. How long, oh Lord, am I gonna have to deal with this kid? 
Well, just put your seatbelt on because you're in for the long haul. That's the bad news. The good news is that these kids like me, and I won't speak for Brian, but he can speak for himself, we're slow learners, but we learn very, we, learn, we change forever. And we have a different profile, a different learning profile, but once we get it, we do pick it up, but we, we learn very slowly, you know? Uh, and um, so we're gonna learn for a long time. And uh, it often takes till 30 for us to find our niche. And I was doing adolescence at 45, and that's not good in your marriage, by the way. And, uh, you know, or at your work, work site. But I've had to like go back and do the developmental work. I missed high school basically because I was too responsible. So I didn't do the fun things that everyone else did. So I have to go back and do that work. You know that therapy they used to have where you get down and crawl, and that, and, you know, like you're a baby and then you work your way up to developmental stages. I had to sort of do that over after my diagnosis and sort of look back and re reframe childhood and decide what was what happened and how I could do better and how I could change it. So I've done a lot of it. I allow myself to travel and have fun and do things so that I can get that out of my system. Uh, okay, the next one is a door with a W on it. That's the willingness to engage. This is something you have to drive into the skull of your learning disabled or SB child, that they need to have willingness to engage and try and talk and speak and ask what they need because they're not gonna get anywhere if they're on their own. So they have to have that's critical for growth as, um, and it's called cognitive flexibility. That's the hallmark of what we wanna teach our kids. Because once you're flexible enough to listen to other people's opinions, no matter whether they're a Jew or a Muslim or whatever, because I wouldn't do it 20 years ago. I was a Catholic and if you weren't Catholic, I wasn't gonna be around you or anything else. And, you know, I'd listen to you. Okay, three minutes, good. I can do this. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this goes for parents as well as students. Working as a team member, learning to form alliances, and learning to form partnerships is how we get along in relationships, how we get along at work. Yes, you can isolate yourself in a cubicle on Wall Street, like my friend who's on the board of AANE who got it, uh, diagnosed at 63 and make a ton of money and retire early, but she, he couldn't keep a relationship. But he was able to, in that little cubicle, make a lot of money for his company. So the next one is PCP. That's what's, um, what's a, this is a person-centered plan. You have to have a certain person-centered plan. All of our students have them. And we do it in our high school summer programs too. What supports the student and parent need to reach, you notice I said parent need to reach the goal? because the parent might need to be in therapy at the same time the kid's getting help, because you've been through the mill too. And remember, the Asperger's doesn't fall far from the tree, so that means one or you, or both of you, or an uncle or someone has probably the, le the same learner disability as your student has, or some variation of it. So that means it's family system. Um, who to partner with, what supports are needed. So you need to have a plan about that. Okay, I got three left, and I think I can do it. The Tulip Garden. So I like to talk about a tulip garden because in early May you have a lot of t tulips bloom. In the, I mean, a few of them anyway. In the middle of May you have a whole lot of tulips bloom, and at the end of May you still have tulips bloom. So the late bloomers, even though I'm a late bloomer, it doesn't mean that my flower is not going to be just as beautiful. So some of you students out there, I know there's, there's a lot of students here. You know, just have to be true to yourself and you'll bloom eventually and you'll be just as good. It won't, it's just different. So we have a different profile. So um, I wanted to say thanks everyone for coming. And the last part of it, the Think Positive Stones. When you, and you, before you leave, you can get one of the Think Positive Stones. These are a tactile reminder and a cue that you can put in your pocket or your purse to, to remember to shift to change your attitude, to, um, to uh, get rid of negative thoughts, and also to get rid of your limiting beliefs that keep you from achieving your success. So uh, I'm gonna pass it off to our illustrious panel here, and we'll talk at the end. Thank you.